Good morning, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Minister of Culture and Business Affairs, Chief Economists from uh, competition authorities throughout Europe, uh, Governor of the Central Bank of Iceland, academics, uh, and other distinguished guests, both here at Harpa Concert Hall and on, on the internet. My name is Paul Gunnar Paulsson and uh, I'm the Director General of the Icelandic Competition Authority and I have the honour to uh, welcome you to this conference where we seek to answer the question how can competition curb soaring inflation and the cost of living crisis. And uh, being a small economy with its own currency, Iceland is no stranger to an ever changing uh, economic environment where inflation is a constant threat to uh, the well-being of consumers and businesses as well. Uh, what is relatively new to us is that the discomfort in, of inflation has currently become the, the focus of governments in most countries, irrespective of the size. And the question stated in the headline of this conference has become an urgent one to many. Competition enforcement is not usually considered uh, a tool that is suited to uh, address short-term monetary or macroeconomic issues. However, it's widely recognized that robust competition in markets is one of the most important components in a strong uh, and stable economy. And in line with this, oligopolistic markets and lack of competition can adversely affect the economy as a whole. In this regard, lack of competition can set the scene for uh, business, uh, businesses charging more than necessary to cover rising costs, and by that, accelerating inflation. In the US, the Biden administ administration has called upon enforcement agencies uh, to strengthen its competition policies to identify and tackle competition obstacles as a way to help the battle against uh, inflation, mm -hmm. or greedflation, as some like mm -hmm. to call it. In these circumstances, consumers and the general public is put in harm's way. High rises in prices have led to a cost of living crisis in, in many countries. Here in Iceland, the Competition Authority has launched a study that hopefully can shed a light on how supply chain disruptions and other disruptions uh, contribute to rise in consumer prices. Uh, or if there are indications of competition obstacles contributing to those rises in prices. It is also widely recognized that competition can benefit employees and competition authorities have intervened in markets uh, uh, where anti-competitive mergers or agreements would have harmed workers. As the chief economists of most competition authorities within the European economic area have gathered in Iceland today uh, for uh, biannual discussions on competition policy, we found this to be a great opportunity to raise these uh, pressing questions and seek answers to them. The conference consists of uh, opening remarks from the Minister of Culture and Business Affairs and uh, then a keynote note presentation by the Chief Economist of the GG Competition, uh, followed by a lively discussion uh, between panel members with wide-ranging experience from several jurisdictions. Finally, the Chairman of the Board of the Competition Authority in Iceland, Svein Agnarsson, will close the meeting. But first, our distinguished Minister of Culture and Business Affairs, uh, Affairs Lilia Alfredsdóttir, will uh, open the meeting with her, her remarks. Uh, prior to her political career, Lilia held um, various positions at the Central Bank of Iceland and the International Monetary Fund in, in Washington, D.C. Lilia holds an MA in <coughs> economics from Columbia Columbia University in, in, New, York, in New York. Lilia, the floor is yours. Uh, 
Dear guests, it's a great honor to be here today. Uh, as uh, the director of the competition authorities in Iceland said, uh, I've held previous positions uh, and experienced quite a bit. I was uh, at the central bank when we had a complete financial meltdown. You can just imagine being a central banker and you know that um, you know the whole banking system is being put into liquidation. That was an experience and we were put on a list of uh, terrorist countries because we had a dispute with the UK and many, many things. And then I was the Minister of Education when we had the COVID, thank you very much. And I was you know, talking to our epidemiologist every day to keep our schools open. That was an experience, I can tell you. Uh, so uh, I've been in many places, but always enjoyed it. And one of my new new passions uh, is without a doubt uh, competition and how we can strengthen everything around basically the uh, the regulatory framework of competition because certainly today we are uh, facing a new challenge a challenge that we thought at least in, in in Iceland that we would well you never think that inflation is gone because you know history tells us it it comes up and it, it's actually not a surprise that we have uh, this environment or, uh, this environment after the COVID uh, because you've had these governments, because we had to put a lot of fiscal uh, support in order just to, for instance, keep our tourism. Tourism is a, is a, is a large industry in Iceland. It creates about 40% of our export revenues and it had invested a lot before the COVID and for us it was paramount that we would keep them up, uh, you know, basically not running. They could not obviously be running, but we would give them the necessary support. But this, of course, put a lot of, you know, money into the system and then people couldn't spend and, you know, saving were rising and then suddenly this happens plus uh, the Russian invasion in, in Ukraine, which is a, which is a, a horrible uh, event, a horrible war, which I am very concerned that we have not seen uh, the consequences, uh, both uh, as regards to losing all this human capital, which is horrible, uh, plus uh, all the risks to the global economy that it presents. So uh, competition is now I want to uh, learn everything I can about competition and how we can positively affect our economy uh, and uh, how we can increase uh, competition, production and make our economy more competitive than it has been. So uh, dear guests, uh, after decades of fighting inflation in Iceland, we have over recent years enjoyed a relatively stable prices with low inflation and a rise in the purchasing power and an economic welfare of the general public. We were relatively quick to recover after the financial meltdown. Uh, Iceland has one of the highest GDP per capita. We have, uh, since we have uh, our distinguished governor here uh, of the central bank in the room, we have a pretty good resource and I, I would say that the economic management for the last uh, 10, 10 years or so has been quite sound. Uh, but in the 70s and the 80s, uh, inflation was very high in, in Iceland. And I even remember it when I was seven uh, in the year uh, 1980 and we were changing, uh, basically t taking up a new uh, krona. And I had to learn everything about inflation at that time because you could basically see just the value of the money uh, evaporate quite quickly. So we are kind of raised up with inflation and we have more... Uh, CPI indexed debt than I think you know many other countries because of this legacy. Uh, but a lot of things has been working basically in, in, in favor of having a low inflation environment as you all might know. I mean we've seen an increased international trade and globalization which has definitely brought great benefits uh, to the people uh, in the world and especially the poorest countries. And as you know, you know, the World Bank has estimated that increased international trade has lifted over a billion people from dire poverty over the past three decades. And of course, the biggest variable there is the 
is the People's Republic of China, since we've seen uh, tremendous changes to their uh, economy and economic management. But this is a fact. I mean, they are basically the machine of the world and they've been producing a lot of uh, low cost goods that is being shipped all around the world. But unfortunately, the world economy has recently suffered a number of, down, uh, of, of uh, challenges. And for the first time in two decades, uh, there has been an uh, increase in uh, people living in poverty. And uh, even though I want to be up, up a bit here in, in on Monday morning, but we definitely see that uh, we see a rising numbers of people living in poverty and uh, the result of the uh, Ukraine of the war in Ukraine will definitely be a large contributing factor uh, and greater than I think that we still uh, that we are anticipating. Uh, and this is a worrying development and we need to take it very seriously. Uh, I mean all key economic uh, management around the world, international institutions and, and the global powers, they will have to basically uh, take this challenge on because we will, there will be a lot of side effects because of rising poverty. We will see uh, increased movement of people that are difficult to place because there has been such a big movement of people, uh, but it's plus, it both uh, it's the climate change and then uh, now uh, with uh, with the war in Ukraine. Uh, and as we witnessed during the first months of the corona crisis period, uh, the response from nation states to crisis periods is often to isolate themselves from the outside world. For fighting uh, the virus, uh, that strategy can indeed be successful, but, talk, uh, but addressing economic issues, isolation is not the correct path to take. And it was extremely, uh, you know, having this challenge, both uh, just before, I mean, the US and China relationship has been, you know, basically maybe not, they, they could have been working better on the relationship. And then you have the coronavirus and now the war in Ukraine. And we can see that even though uh, we have a new president in the US, they have not changed their policy as regards to China and, and trade. And that is a concern to everyone because if the, the, the hegemon of the world is behaving the way they are and not in, increasing globalization and, and, and trade, uh, the side effects for every economy will be uh, more than we anticipate. And as I said, the Russian invasion for Ukraine comes directly after the COVID-related recession, resulting in increased uh, uh, energy prices in Europe, difficulties and, and gaps in the food chain supplies, and in other areas resulting from the sanctions imposed on Russia. We will see prices for wheat and grain increase as um, no less than a third of the global supply of wheat comes from Russia and Ukraine. And we can already see this all in the prices in our, our, our goods of basket. The world economy, therefore, has some difficult issues to resolve in the coming years, as this recession and the following inflation can be somewhat directly linked to uh, international man-made circumstances that we do know, uh, however, foresee that will change in the short time. Nations of the world need to come together in efforts to fight the ongoing trend of isolation and rising trade barriers because of their uh, trade environment where companies complete, compete on a level playing field that is the most effective way of increasing the living standards and of the people living in the world of ours. Competition can be both global and local and we and will deliver on a large scale and on a small scale. Globalization and international trade allows countries to capitalize on their competitiveness and increase the living standards of its citizens. On the local scale, competition contributes to effectively run companies and the efficient use of valuable resources. In an environment where companies are faced with competition, 
prices cannot be raised on the sole reason of increases in input prices. In an environment of increased inflation, competitive pressure results in better run companies that will deliver goods and services to customers without excessive price hikes. An economy that thrives on, comp on competitive pressures will constantly constantly deliver better living standards than less competitive economies and foster innovative companies that seek and develop new ways of manufacturing and delivering goods and services. That is the economy that we're aiming for and hopefully many more nations will do so also. And I think uh, that this is so important today since we are fighting inflation that we have a robust competition authority and i'm glad to say that uh, i very much respect and uh, admire our competition authorities they have been successful and they're always um, they're always you know looking at the ball and i can also inform you that i got to know uh, the director when he was uh, he was the director of the uh, financial supervisor authorities but guess what he did? I think like five years before of the collapse, he left. That was a very smart decision of him. <laughs> so anyway, dear guests, uh, it's an honor to stand here and discuss competition uh, matters. Uh, I have to leave very briefly, but I'll be back in, in 20 minutes. So uh, I look forward to listening and learning. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lilia, for your uh, interesting overview and your kind words towards the competition authority. Um, uh, next, we will hear the keynote uh, remarks on inflation, market power, and competition policy. Pierre Rigibo the, uh, is, the, is the chief competition economist of the GG competition. He has specialized in the field of industrial organization, law and economics, and international business, and holds an, a PhD in economics from the University of California at Berkeley. And since 1987, he has held teaching position as, at the MIT, Northwestern, Northwestern uh, Western University, and the University of Barcelona, and the University of Access. Essex, uh, where he is currently a, a visiting honorary professor. And after his remarks, Valo Thrawonsson, the chief economist of the ICA, will take over and lead the, the panel discussion. But Pierre, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm going to try something I usually don't do. I'm going to try to stay the lectern, uh, because you know walking around is a little bit you know, crowded here. So thank you very much for having me in this absolutely uh, beautiful uh, place. Now, uh, the first time I heard a few months ago that people in the US especially were worried about the link between inflation and competition policy, I was aghast, especially because the version in the US was not what can competition policy do to help, but was is the fact that we know the concentration has increased the cause for uh, inflation. So, uh, but unfortunately, Margaret of Tiger got interested in this, so actually I had to think seriously about it. And I'm going to present you essentially the result of those thoughts in essentially kind of three stages. The first one is going to take, add on the US claim that actually it's because we have more concentrated sectors than before that we have that big inflation. And you can guess what my answer is going to be. That actually makes very, very little sense. The second part will ask a different question. Given that you know inflation results from shocks in the economy and the handling of monetary policy and so on, is there any way in which the structure of the economy concentration might amplify or dampen the effect of those shocks, the pass through of those shocks onto uh, the price level? And then the third, the third part is going to be, well, even if we're not the cause of what we're facing, are there things that we can do on the competition side to at least kind of mitigate uh, the effect of inflation and kind of help, essentially. So starting with the first part, I would like to make first two preliminary remarks. If you think about causality and you tell me that 
a sudden burst in inflation right now is the result of a well-documented 20 to 25 years increase, slow increase in concentration, you've got to believe in non-linearity in a way which goes beyond what my belief in the non-linearity of economies are. You know, nothing happened for 18 years, and then you've got this mushrooming of finally, you know, this reckoning. You have to think that the economy works a bit like climate was, it might be kind of critical at that level. I don't believe that. So that's already a fairly strong argument for not believing that most of the inflation is due to the evolution, to the adverse evolution in the concentration of some industrial uh, sector that has been documented in the US and in the EU. The second thing is that the effect that inflation has on prices is not of the, quite the same nature as the effect that competition policy has on prices. With inflation... Uh, oh, yes, I, I always forget, forget my slide. Important. This was inserted by my secretary, so that's a disclaimer. Oh, yes, I've gone through the old lights. So, that, uh, so where, where was I now? <laughs> uh, we come back to that. So, the, the, the first question here is, if you're not convinced by this general argument, what kind of other evidence would you look at? One of the first things that you would want to do is look at the evolution of inflation over time, over a longer period. And this gives you the evolution of inflation in 2016. And of course, now, to the right, we would have a bigger spike. But you see, we've got very, very big spikes before. Okay? And clearly, there was no documented increase in concentration during this period. So it doesn't mean that current inflation is not the result of high concentration, but it tells you that you can have very high inflation without concentration being a factor at all. So that's the first point. The second, which is interesting, is to look at the rate of inflation, this is a bit two months old now, I mean across, across the countries. And as you see, you do have quite a bit of variety, right? And we know that the progress in concentration across country has not been that different. So if we really thought that concentration was the main cause of inflation, we would have to think, for example, that Lithuania has had much, has much more, and the Netherlands, has much more concentrated industry sectors than, say, Spain or Italy or France which is not generally what we would think. I mean, if anything, we'd think that the, that the correlation would go the other way. So that's another you know, little piece that tells you that we're probably bucking up the wrong tree if we want to turn on a competition policy and its lack of enforcement and therefore the increase in concentration. The second thing is that it's kind of interesting that if you look at the inflation forecast as of, I think, 2020 or something like that, well, they were way off, right? Now, you'd think that if it was so obvious that increased concentration would eventually lead to inflation, and everybody knows there's been increased concentration, they would have gotten the expectation a bit better than that. Something that is, you know, the end result of a long trend would not come as much of a surprise. So that's another uh, you know, element in my case. So... Another important aspect is to look at the pattern by sectors. And here you have the classification by sectors. This is a graph which is taken out of the recent work of Tommaso Valetti, uh, uh, Jabosz Loris, and, and Gabor Colte in the Chief Economics team that has done a very detailed study of the evolution of concentration in different sectors. So you've got the ranking of sectors based on how much concentration has increased in those sectors. Well, now let's try to compare this with the rate of inflation that you see by sector. And if you look, for example, you know, at communications, which was one of the sectors where you had, had the toughest increase in concentration, well, here, actually, at that time, inflation was negative. And actually, if you try to correlate the sectors based on how much concentration has increased and what the inflation rates are, you actually get a negative correlation. 
And that's not that surprising, because if you look at this, you know, the explanation is clear. I mean, the sectors that were affected by energy most are the ones that had most inflation. And that is the main factor that has nothing to do with the level of concentration. Okay. A final argument, and that has to do with the point that I made about the different kind of nature of the change in prices. If you have inflation, eventually things catch up. Right. It might take time, but bargaining uh, by, by trade unions, indexing, and so on, we know that in the long run, there will be a tendency for things to be kind of neutral. Now, we never get to the long run, and a lot of damage can be done on the way to the long run. But still, in the end, the kind of inflation increase that we have do not correspond necessarily to big changes in real magnitudes. On the other hand, any kind of change in the price levels that we affect through the implementation of competition policy, say keeping concentration low because we block an anti-competitive mergers, these are real increase in the purchasing power of consumers. So the nature of the price changes affected is actually quite different between overall inflation and the kind of price changes that we can affect through the implementation of competition policy. Then finally, just to put things into order, it just cannot be that competition policy can routinely be a cause of inflation. Why? Take the following exercise, back of the envelope computation. Assume that every sector in the economy is full monopoly. You assume a level of cost and a demand, so that on average the Profit margin at about 35%, which seems already fairly high, but fine. You do that. And you say, OK, now suppose we go in all of those sectors, you know, the best competition policy you can even dream of, from monopoly to perfect competition. By how much would the price level go down? 50%. Now, this is a one-time increase. Once you're down there, there's no further possible improvement. So if you think that the world has only been there for 20 years, that at the most would account for 2.5% inflation a year. If you think the world has been around there for 50 years, that accounts for actually less than 1% a year. And of course, we don't start with a complete monopoly. You can recalibrate this by taking the actual concentration level and deriving the forward the price level is. And then what you get is a maximum, maximum, maximum impact of about 22 or 23 percent. So that, I think, is a fairly strong argument that competition policy cannot by itself be responsible for that much in terms of inflation. So that was the first part uh, of my uh, intervention. And we're going to jump a little bit to stuff. I always do this. Drives, drives my wife, for example, completely crazy. Since I do slides that I don't really follow them. But that's, 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 that's the way I do. Now, uh, the second part, the second question was, OK, I think we are, or at least I'm convinced, that competition policy has very little to do in terms of the cause of the inflation we experience right now. But what we all agree, and the minister made that point, is that the situation we're in is certainly the result of different kind of shocks, a more kind of demand shocks coming from the COVID, or the, and then more kind of supply side shocks coming now through the Ukraine crisis. And there is a literature in macroeconomics, and micro as well, about how those shocks are transmitted from the cost side to the consumer side, and how this can be affected by the degree of competition. So for once, economic theory is fairly unambiguous, which is good, so we should use it. And the result that it tells you is that if it's a demand shock, then having less competition will tend to magnify the effect of those shock. If you have supply shock, it goes the other way, unless you happen to believe that everywhere demands are extremely convex and so on, which is a little uh, ridiculous. Now, if you take this, you tell yourself, look, then maybe some of the inflation started by COVID that was to a large extent, a demand shock. Yes, that maybe the fact that our sectors have been more less competitive than before might have magnified things. But what we do see now, which is a reaction to supply shocks, actually is the effect, if anything, should go the other way. Okay. And then to probably what is 
supposed to be the most interesting part is that after spending my time saying that, hey, it's not my problem, nothing to do with this, which is an attractive position for me to take. I think I already have enough work <laughs> with, with, with the daily cases. Uh, you know, it's a bit too cheap. So what could we possibly uh, contribute, right? And before that, you know, let's remember what we do. We have, you know, merger, cartel control, so we, that has almost direct effect on the prices. Through antitrust, we also try to uh, preserve kind of level playing fields. That has good effects not only on the prices, but also uh, on innovation and so on and so on. That's the usual spiel. But in this precise circumstance, what are the kind of things that we could potentially do? First, don't, let's not screw up the way in which, on a day-to-day, -day, we apply competition policy just because somebody thinks that we should deal with inflation. So long-term costs of this would be just too strong. Competition policy is a structural policy. We are in the long term. We should not be distracted by short-term events, however important they might be. Now, there are still things that we should look at. So far, all of my presentation as for economists, but in terms of what we call unilateral effects, I has not talked about the possibility of them colluding with each other. So is it possible that the environment that we have in an inflationary environment could be magnified because it creates a more prospicious environment for firms to collude and therefore kind of raise prices further? Now, from a strict economic point of view, there's no reason to believe that because, you know, inflation kind of affects both incentive to deviate, incentive to collude, so as a usual thing, it kind of hits both ways. You just don't know. But let's take a step back from just model theory economics and look at the real world. In the real world, I think there might be some more room for concern. Why? Because, as we know, one of the problems with collusion, even if there's still some collu already some collusion going on, is to get the right signal to move to a higher price level. The fact that price are moving up on their own can facilitate such movement, can facilitate at least moving away from the status quo. It also makes it a bit harder for this price increase to be detected, for example, by competition authority. So from that point of view, I think it would behoove the competition authority to keep an eye on a few sectors where the prices have gone up quite drastically. I know, for example, that uh, at the European Commission, we do keep an eye on the construction sector, where you know that all the material prices have gone up. And we were initially very concerned that, you know, they would go up, but would not go down. Hopefully, they're starting to go down. But that you have to decide for your own economy what are the few sectors where the prices have gone up a lot and are therefore worse kind of uh, increased kind of scrutiny. And I think that's very well uh, to, uh, 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 worth doing. Another thing that we can do, I told you there's a difference between inflation and the kind of price you can, uh, change you can affect, that in inflation eventually, hopefully, you know, labor catches up and has wage increase that eventually compensates them, at least partially, for uh, their loss of market power. Well, that might be true in general, but there might be sectors of the economy where labor is especially vulnerable. And one of those sectors is what we call the gig economy, where those people are supposedly independent entrepreneurs, but because of this, supposedly they cannot actually negotiate together because that would be collusion. So the recent work that the Commission has been doing, trying to remove this perceived competition law impact, saying that no, for platform workers under some condition and so on, they are actually allowed to uh, negotiate uh, kind of together as a trade union would do, is important in itself, because I think it's fair, but it's especially important in inflationary time, because it gives them a fighting chance of not uh, bearing the full impact of a decrease in the purchasing power. Okay. Two more points about what we can do. Uh, the minister pointing out quite rightly, the importance of supply shock disruption and supply chain disruption. And whenever you have that, and it was true for COVID as well, the industry's reaction is that, oh yes, if you just let us coordinate, everything would be better. Well, that's a bit too easy. 
Uh, because, of course, they always love to coordinate because they think if they can coordinate on one thing, or if we care for, or if we care for the authorities or try to be designing in accepting the agreement, they'll be able to coordinate on something else. But don't just give me a slogan. Tell me, you know, how you're going to coordinate and how it's going to make things better. In particular, if you think about the, the willingness, the desire to be, if not more independent, but more protective against international shocks, it means that you want your industries to source in a more diversified manner than they would do on their own. I remain to be convinced of why having them working together would lead to more rather than less diversification. I don't think there's any economic theory that says that if you coordinate, you're going to diversify more and therefore move more in the direction of what is good for the country. So we should be very, very kind of careful about those slogans. They always have a good reason to want to coordinate more. And that leads me to the last point. There will be, of course, other policies that will take care of the distortion and inflation and stuff like that. I'm not talking about macro policies that will do the job and tend to not interfere at all with the level of competition in specific industries. But there are always creative people who are going to tell you, oh, you know, we need to be independent in microchips. We need to do, do, do this and this and this. And some of this might be even you know, legitimate uh, goals that are being pursued. But what is very important is to not let that contaminate basic principle of competition policy. So, for example, in terms of microchips, the approach was to ring fence it and have a specific legislation that is based, you know, on this concept of first of a kind, which has, you know, its strengths and weaknesses. We can discuss this another day. But it's very important, for example, to not just say, oh, we're just going to deal with those issues with the usual state aid principle, just fudging a little bit on the right. Because if there's one thing that you learn, working as an economist at the commission, is that if you start fudging, people are going to take it away and run away with it. And, you know, before you know it, you will not have an effective competition policy anymore. Thank you very much. Um, and congratulations to be able to show up at 8 o'clock. Um, we in Iceland, we tend to uh, do compare everything in per capita. And so I was doing a back and forth envelope calculation. So if we would be in Denmark, there would be 900 people here. Uh, but uh, as well, it's nice to be seeing people in real life again. Uh, my name is Valur Thrawinsson, and I'm the Chief Economist of the Competition Authority. Uh, I will be moderating the panel discussion uh, with this great panel here, and Martin Gaynor, which is uh, online and will be on our screen uh, shortly. Um, so, uh, as has been mentioned, and I'm not going to dwell on, is that we, have, we are seeing high inflation, which is at which Peter has talked a lot about, but at the same time, and why, there, why there is this fuss about whether competition policy can contribute anything to, to that, is that we are seeing corporate profits at the same time uh, reaching sky high limits. So that could as well be the, pro be the reason why this is in the discussion. If they wouldn't be uh, having uh, record profits, we would, wouldn't probably be discussing inflation and competition policy which I think is as well uh, an important point. So uh, I'm going to introduce the panel members. We have Ana Sofia Rodriguez, the chief economist and the head of Bureau of Economic Studies at the Portuguese Competition Authority uh, since 2015. Uh, she uh, worked at the OECD as a competition expert and, and before that time at the authority as well. Uh, she has a PhD from the University of York. Uh, then we have uh, Ausger Jonsson, uh, our governor here at the Central Bank, which is, if you look in that direction, uh, is his office are over there in the black house. It's like you can't see through the windows, and it's, it's really secret. It's the yes, it's from the dark side. <laughs> No, he, he has served there since 2019 and received his PhD degree from, the, from Indiana University in 2001. Prior to that, uh, he served as 
the president of the economics department here at the University of Iceland. Uh, then lastly, we have Martin Gaynor, which is here in this room in the US. Uh, and I was uh, uh, talking about how, uh, how good you were to show up here at 8 o'clock. I think it's, uh, what, 5 o'clock? No, 5 o'clock. It's, it's, it's not yet 5 o'clock by, by us. OK. So he woke up at 3 o'clock. And I'm not sure whether he went to sleep. OK. <laughs> so he has coughed up. Uh, he will be taking a part in the, uh, the meeting that we will have here later today. And unfor unfortunately, he couldn't, we couldn't join here in person. Uh, but we're very much looking to hear from him. He's a university professor of economics and public policy at Carnegie Mellon University. And he's the former director of the Bureau of Economic uh, at the U.S. Federal Trade Commission. Uh, his, mainly, his focus on research, on competition and incentives in healthcare and on antitrust policy. He, he received his PhD one year before I was born from the U Northern U Northwestern University, University in 1983. And Pierre needs no introduction. Uh, but uh, before uh, I asked the panel to take a seat. Uh, there are some housekeeping rules that I wanted to uh, uh, share with you. Uh, we have, uh, uh, last time I, uh, up the online numbers were updated, uh, around 100 online audience, if I'm right, uh, and all of you here. So if you have any questions, raise your hand. Uh, the audiences that are online, they can use Slido, I think. Okay. Uh, and as well, I'm going to do to the, that we are not following uh, our time schedule very, sl st uh, very strictly. Uh, I'm going to try to moderate the panel in a slightly different way. Uh, so after the introductory remarks of Martin, Anna, and Ausger, uh, we will, inst instead of having panel discussion for 20 minutes and then questions from the audience, we will uh, I will give you the opportunity to ask from the, from, the, from the start. So please raise your hand if you have questions. Uh, if, the, if you think that you will have a better questions than, you, than I do, then you probably have. So please do. And lastly, uh, then I just wanted to invite the panel to uh, their seats. And I wonder whether... Uh, Anna is willing, no, whether Martin is willing to give his uh, few remarks, initial remarks, and respond to Pierre's speech. Welcome, Martin. Sure, thanks. Uh, great to be here with, with everyone virtually, and thanks so much for, uh, for accommodating me. So uh, I just, I don't really have a whole lot to, to add to, to Pierre's very excellent talk, but, but just let me reinforce some of the things that he said, uh, of course, we know that uh, theoretically uh, uh, industries with market power can do things like amplify demand shocks, that price increases due to demand shock can be larger in an industry with market power than one that's perfectly competitive. And again, as Pierre pointed out quite rightly, if it's a supply shock, that, uh, that actually uh, an industry with market power would dampen that effect rather than, uh, than amplify it. But we also know that theoretically just about anything is, is possible. So uh, a couple things about that. One, what we know from the, the, this theory is, ha, tells us about one-time effects, not what macroeconomists, at least um, I used to learn macro back when I was a grad student before uh, Valor was, uh, was walking around this planet or, or toddling around this, this planet, uh, but not what macroeconomists talk about when inflation, because that's an ongoing problem, not simply one-time price increases. But in, anyhow, uh, this is an empirical matter. As Pierre quite rightly pointed out, the evidence just doesn't point in that direction. I do have just a, a couple other uh, pieces of uh, empirical patterns that I think might be useful to take a look at. If, if we could have the slide that uh, I provided you with now, please. Yes. yes. Right. Thanks very much. And this is, these are for the, the U.S. and uh, these are just two graphs, one which uh, Jason Furman 
um, who's now at Harvard uh, generating the other, uh, Jose uh, Azar uh, generated. The, uh, the one on the left has, uh, has four firm concentration ratios and inflation from 2020 to 2022. And you can see that it's basically a, a, a flat a flat line. You just don't get any relationship between um, price increases over that period and concentration by industry. And uh, and the right hand one, which Jose generated, is he generated measures of markups using um, the methods that uh, Jan DeLocca and Jan Eckhout have used, and then looked at the correlation of those with inflation over the same time period, uh, 2020 to 2022. And if anything, it's negatively correlated. So that's consistent again. Both these are consistent with things that Pierre said. And actually the latter, I don't want to push this too hard because, and I'm sure neither Jose nor Jason would either. Um, uh, these are not uh, causal associations necessarily, but the latter, the negative relationship is consistent with the kind of patterns that we can get in some theoretical models with regard to um, the effects of supply shocks, right? You can get a dampening of those things in industries with more market power. So anyhow, I, I think the evidence just doesn't line up with the claims about market power, not just being a cause of inflation, being a, even a, a substantial driver of inflation. It's not to say it can't contribute to some degree, but but we're just not seeing patterns in the data that are consistent with that. I'm, I'm, I'm done with the, the slide, thanks. So uh, what about antitrust enforcement or, or competition policy? Uh, again, I, I concur with Pierre, but one thing I do want to say is I think that um, there's really a very limited role here. For one thing, market power is really not the primary source here. There can be some bits and pieces here and there. But also it's important to realize that when it comes to enforcement, as everybody knows, things take a really, really long time. If you want to have an impact on inflation in real time, antitrust enforcement is not the policy lever for you because from the day you start thinking about an issue to the day it's resolved is typically years. That's one thing. And and of course, uh, antitrust is um, something gets applied case by case, market by market. It's not, uh, it's not really exactly any, something that gets a blanket economy wide. It's not a macro policy. So to have a, an effect on the entire economy, um, you would have to have um, either a massive, massive increase in the budgets of competition authorities. I'm sure everyone here is very supportive of that uh, or have to have uh, massive deterrence effects. And I don't think the evidence indicates that deterrence effects are, are large enough, unfortunately, to have that kind of kind of impact. So there are some things that can be done. Yeah, pay attention to collusion, although tacit collusion, at least in the US, is beyond the reach of antitrust enforcement. And that could be a major source of um, of some one time price increases. But but do that um, and be thinking about other kind of policy tools and perhaps be thinking about competition policy more broadly, of which antitrust enforcement is one component. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, Anna. Well, thank you, Valu, and I would like to uh, thank the Icelandic Competition Authority for uh, having me in this great panel, but also for welcoming uh, the ECN Chief Economist uh, meeting. It's, it's really uh, a pleasure to be uh, here in, in Reykjavik. Now, I, I, I couldn't agree more with all the points that Pierre has set out in, in the beginning, in, in particular regarding causality. I think it's uh, um, it's it's not very uh, a good uh, use of time to be thinking about what the culprits are for the current inflation trend when we are pretty much aware of why this is happening. It has to do obviously with the energy prices that has soared even more after the the, the war in Ukraine started about the prices of food, about uh, um, uh, when we reopen the economy following the lockdown measures. It's about, obviously, maybe govern government uh, stimuli as well, um, and uh, um, uh, bottlenecks uh, in supply. So we, we have a pretty clear idea of what is driving the current inflationary trend. That is not to say, of course, that uh, you know it's still an empirical question uh, whether there are second order effects of the concentration levels, but uh, it's also true that we know for a long time that there's an issue of concentration and markups on the, on the concentration. Obviously, we might have 
um, uh, uh, some doubt regarding uh, uh, the empirical results because they're not relevant uh, markets as we define them in competition policy. But we have a very clear idea since a long time that there's an issue of concentration and rising markups. Uh, and inflation is a, a, a much more recent problem. So in terms of, of uh, the overlap in time, there's no reason as well, and Pierre has pointed that out, uh, to, to think that uh, the, the problems uh, that we have been uh, diagnosing in terms of concentration uh, are uh, at, the, at the basis of this inflationary trend. Now, uh, we also know uh, that uh, theoretically there's no reason to expect the path-through of uh, cost increases to be uh, uh, bigger in monopoly than in other more competitive uh, markets. Now, all that is true, but we also know that both inflation and uh, uh, lack of uh, competition lead to higher price levels. Uh, inflation, uh, um, um, lack of competition leads obviously to, to it, it has an impact on the level of prices. It's not so much about rapid uh, increases in prices. Uh, we know that competition uh, in the longer term is going to, to put a pressure, a downwards pressure on profit margins and costs. We know also that there are several empirical uh, studies that point that competitive markets reduce the vulnerability of price levels to swings in capacity pressure that firms in industries with lower search and switching costs um, or uh, otherwise with higher uh, search and switching costs um, um, have uh, um, uh, in industries as such, firms uh, will more likely appropriate and benefit from inflation uh, in the form of larger markups. So uh, now, what is the role of competition policy in, in all this? Uh, certainly, uh, I agree that it's not a lax merger control that underlies the problem, but that doesn't mean that there's no role for uh, competition uh, policy. And on here, I'll touch upon two aspects. One has to do with competition enforcement, and another one, uh, which I think has not been uh, so much discussed at, uh, up to now, is on competition advocacy, which I think is very important. And in our experience at the Portuguese Competition Authority, there's a few things that I would like to share. In terms of competition uh, enforcement, uh, obviously we know that, uh, and I think that's not debatable, that it can contribute to controlling uh, price levels. And it is key in deterring conduct that make, may make uh, uh, the price levels higher and thus uh, worsen uh, the problem of inflation. Now here I think it's important also uh, to be uh, aware that there's a lot of talk about how, uh, by firms now, how, how they are going to react to inflation. This can be genuine uh, um, uh, uh, discussions on costs and, and how, how prices uh, will evolve but they can also be invitations to collude. And I think that this price signaling is something uh, that merits a lot of attention from competition agencies, uh, particularly if they are used to disguise a cartel. Now, in terms of advocacy, and I hear uh, uh, there's a couple of things I would like to, to say. First, that as we face the double challenge of having to recover uh, our economies and uh, dealing with this inflationary trend, I think there's more arguments now than ever before to claim for pro-competitive uh, reforms aimed at reducing barriers to enter and expansion, at reducing search and switching costs. Um, uh, uh, this was actually uh, something that uh, the ADC, the Portuguese Competition Authority, did in April uh, last year. We sent a report to the government um, uh, uh, arguing in the favor of uh, uh, um, uh, such policies. We, uh, we argued for the implementation of recommendations that the ADC had been issuing for a long time in various sectors, structural sectors, from energy to transport to ports, um, also to self, uh, to liberal professions, uh, um, and highlighting a number of principles that should be embedded in the uh, design of the recovery and resilience plan, be it through the reduction of barriers to entry, be it through competitive neutrality in state aid and in deploying uh, uh, state support to the economy, being in optimizing public procurement, and I think all those, those measures are more important maybe now than ever before. Now, uh, a last point uh, on uh, some issue that at least in Portugal we have also been dealing and that has been uh, the, the, the focus of some of the recommendations by the ADC, which has to do with price controls. We know that in times of inflation, uh, it's more likely for uh, governments to introduce price, price controls. Um, uh, we also know uh, uh, empirically uh, 
that there seems to be an indication that price controls do not do, uh, uh, ha do not have a significant impact on inflation, but we know that they pose risks to competition. If you put uh, the caps on prices too high, you might provide a focal point for collusion. Mm -hmm. If you put, uh, if you set it at too low a level, you may induce exit. You may induce even sh further supply shortages, which are on <laughs> at the basis of, of the inflationary trend uh, now. So I, here, I think it's very important for competition agencies to uh, raise awareness as to the risk of price controls and, and, and encourage alternative solutions that are less restrictive of competition. Thank, Thank you. you, Anna. Um, Oscar, you're the next. Uh, what I would like to add uh, to, uh, before you give your initial remarks, are is the following. Uh, we have seen that uh, Pierre and the other competition eco economists here that are sitting on both sides of you, uh, they are not very convinced that they have a big play to role here, which is probably the case, the reason why we have central banks around the world. Uh, but still, I would like, if you could, could touch up on that in your initial remarks, whether uh, do you think market power or, or increased competition has has some kind of an effect of the uh, the ability of the Fed uh, to, on the effectiveness of, of its monetary policy as well. So, uh, yeah. Well, thank you. Um, I mean, um, um, first of all, I, I want to make you know, a couple of points. First of all, I, I think that, that the um, causation is actually in the um, you know, reverse. I think that um, it's not that uh, lack, uh, co uh, not that actually competition leads to inflation, rather that in high inflation leads to a, a lower actually competition, because the inflation basically clouds the price signal, and and that's the experience of uh, of Iceland. We we were practically the last country in Western Europe to kind of like uh, get out of the seventies. 80s um, inflationary times in many, many ways. Um, um, but at the same time, it is, it is my belief that uh, our entry into the European economic area, which uh, happened in 93, 94, uh, which led to uh, both increased competition and also uh, the um, removal of um, quite many trade barriers was a sig significant factor for uh, for Iceland to mo mo move into a lower um, inflation um, 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 uh, <coughs> lower in the inflation actually timeline. But for for our, our foreign guests, I can tell you that um, inflation in Iceland peaked at around 83-100% in the early 80s and was 20, 30 percent until the uh, be beginning of the 90s. And there were a couple of other things that happened also, like that we kind of um, adopted a, a fixed um, exchange rate. So, so I, I think that our entry into the European economic area and the, in and the increased competition that followed that, and also what also followed the, our entry into the European e economic area was a greater focus on um, competition or uh, um, authority or basically um, follow the market. Um, in international trade, which I did study you know, um, many years ago, small open economies, they always face the problem of scale versus competition or the number of companies that you have and the scale. And that's why foreign trade and free foreign trade is the most important thing for small open economies um, like Iceland. So, so, why some people, so, so that, that is a huge, huge thing. Um, secondly, um, I think that when you talk about inflation and the effect of competition, it does demand it does matter if it is a supply shock or a actually demand shock. Because um, if the if inflation is mainly supply driven, as we've seen mostly, 
um, computation is a much lower factor than the if it is a demand driven inflation. And we actually have both things. Because of what we've actually seen, for example, in the stock markets, is that the pricing of quite many companies, like, like actually retailers, is being lowered because the feeling or the thinking is in the market that these companies might not be able to, um, to actually uh, kind of like pass through the higher price of imports or inputs into the um, outgoing prices. So I think that we are mainly seeing on supply shock, although there is a demand aspect to it. But it's a, um, um, and my third point is that um, um, I think that, I mean, when you have, as, as I think the, you, you all mentioned, when you have a um, um, period of high inflation, especially in countries like Iceland and Scandinavia, when you have a very high level of social coordination, a very long record of kind of this cooperation between the government, the, the labor unions, uh, employees, federations, kind of like to keep stability, it, it also can create complacency. Because usually corporates that um, are uh, oligopolistic or, or, or lack or in some, somehow have a market, they are in a market power situation, they, they usually do their labor policy quite well. And quite often the yeah, unions become quite kind of a um, other good kind of partners in what they are doing. And I think that is a actually great risk also. Because um, 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 uh, yes, uh, what we have to have to think about. Um, and my fifth, fifth and my last point is that um, concerning inflation and um, competition in the medium term to longer term, it's a question of how fast innovations are adopted or taken up in certain markets. And um, because um, um, there are a number of goods that are on a um, that, are on that, that their price is basically trending down. It not always shows in the CPI, giving it the, their quality um, improvements, like personal computers. But basically, have, since I've bought my first computers, the price has been relatively similar for, for decades, but the quality is always improving. improving. What I'm basically saying is that competition especially new entrants, are really necessary to bring new, new um, cost-saving uh, technologies into the market, and um, which, which is quite important. So, so, um, so I think, you know, I, so, 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 so just to actually sum up, I, I think that my main worry is that inflation will lead to a lower competition. And we might see kind of a um, corporate sector in Iceland that is, that is more complacent, more uh, is using kind of a factor input pricing uh, to basically pass through high, higher costs. And, um, and there is a, a um, lack of um, competition. We should also not underestimate that we are a small open economy and um, inflation expectations are not just a matter for the central bank or, or interest rate decisions. They, they're also a 
they can be co co coordinated. Um, and um, and it's um, quite important that we, uh, as I said, that the demand aspects of the inflation are not turned into higher markups. That the shortages that we see on, on goods are not turned into higher markups. And, and I think there is a, a, a role for the competition authorities in Iceland as well as the um, um, consumer what, what stocks and as we're seeing one, one talk over there, uh, Breki. So, so there is a role to play. And that's why one, one of the reasons why the central bank has been uh, kind of keen to, to, um, to as we point that out. And um, um, uh, as I said, the, from, from our experience, from taking uh, inflation down in Iceland, which was a success in the early 90s. A great part of that was an increased awareness uh, to both competition and 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 um, and uh, prices in the market. So we should be uh, focused very clearly on that. And the, rea the reaction of the the competition enforcer uh, in the panel t in respect to our scarce. I, points. I would re-emphasize a few of the points made by the rest of the panel. I think for Martin, Martin made a very important point about the fact that given the resources will be needed and the time they will be needed mm. to, for competition policy to do kind of anything on the scale that is required to deal uh, with inflation, that's, that's the wrong tool. But, I think but what if we would turn it around? That uh, uh, no, no, I, 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 will, I will come to, the, uh, to, okay. to, 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 to that point too. So, uh, then for Anna, I also agree that one has to worry about, you know, yes, it's tacit collusion in the US, you cannot go after tacit collusion. In principle, we can, but, you know, anyway, most tacit collusion usually t leave traces in terms of document insight, which is the way we actually uh, get at them. I would add that it's not just that we have to worry about uh, price signaling in an Inflationary environment gives CEOs a lot of opportunities to give talks about the conditions and you know the cost and the necessity of passing on costs. So the kind of techniques that somebody like Joe Arrington would push of looking a little bit at the discourse of CEO is actually probably something we should take into account. Now, from the non-macro approach, I'm actually very intrigued by this idea of reverse causation uh, of. Uh, inflation making it uh, more likely that we move to a less competitive uh, uh, environment. It's not something I so deeply uh, about, but one can think of a few kind of mechanisms. One is, it might just be that, you know, it's hard to manage in an inflationary uh, environment. And maybe large companies are relatively better suited to survive in inflationary uh, environment. So when you have high inflation, you have an exit of smaller companies, which in normal time might be more efficient and impose competition, but might not be able to face those circumstances. It's one of the mechanisms I think of. The second is the one you, you mentioned and linked to a point that I made, is that this kind of pass-through mentalities. And when everybody is raising prices and so on, it's much easier to just say, oh, I'm sorry, customers, don't get mad at me. I'm just passing cost. And uh, it's, it's harder to get. And also, you're right. It's also a question of me mentality. If you, can, if you can, if you think, can just pass on the cost, you're going to worry a little less about being efficient and so on. And from that point of view, and again, it's not causation there, but one thing that I know is that if you look at the evolution in the Europe over the COVID and Ukraine crisis, we see that actually the economy has kind of recovered to uh, not only the pre-crisis level, but almost a trend, on, except on one dimension, and that's investment in R&D. So that's another broader issue, which again, I haven't thought about, it's probably worth thinking about, is what would be the impact of an inflationary environment on the incentive to innovate. Martin, do you have any comments? Yes, thank you, and just thanks to, uh, to Oscar and Anna and uh, Pierre, again, this is just uh, an excellent panel. Let me say, um, the following 
Lack of competition is still a major urgent problem, even if it really does not have a lot to do with the inflation we're experiencing. Don't take anything I think, I'm sure everyone else would agree with me. Don't take what we're saying about, this is not a driver of inflation to mean that we don't have a problem. We have a problem and it's always a good time for more active competition policy. So this is something that still needs to be uh, be paid attention to. It's and it's and it's really quite urgent, but it was urgent before we were experiencing inflation. It's still it's still urgent now. Uh, and I think on this point about advocacy is a good one and it resonates with uh, some of the things Pierre was saying as well. Um, firms are always looking for opportunities to be innovative in ways to thwart competition. And one of those is taking advantage of environments to promote protectionist policies and a competition authority can play an important role there. It can also play an important role in speaking out um, in favor of pro-competition policies. So again, uh, avoiding protectionism, avoiding erecting barriers to entry, barriers to trade, but also speaking out against bad ideas, such as price controls for, for gasoline or, or that, uh, that kind of thing. And these things come up over and over again. And I will mention parenthetically, or perhaps not, that um, this is a problem right now in the US because neither of the antitrust enforcement agencies has a chief economist. And it appears like the folks in charge of those agencies are actually not particularly interested in economics or hearing from from economists. The Council of Economic Advisors um, has really not spoken out on competition issues as well. So there's a big gap in advocacy uh, for uh, competition and pro-competitive policies are the part of economists in a position to do so in the in the US. Um, at last, I, I'm, I think it's an intriguing idea again that um, inflation could uh, end up harming competition. I'm not convinced that is necessarily the case. I can imagine all kinds of uh, possible outcomes, uh, some of which would be consistent with that and some of which would not. So, so I don't know, but it, it's certainly something worth paying attention to. And again, as, as others have pointed out, I think the, the, the politics and the political economy uh, are, are potentially problematic. Thanks. Uh, Martin, before I give uh, another word, uh, you mentioned that uh, though inflation is uh, competition, lack of competition is, is not causing inflation. You said in a, in a one sentence, uh, we still have a big problem and the uh, and I think the root for this discussion about the relationship between inflation uh, is from on the from the U.S. side uh, due to some problems that you mentioned. Can you describe for the for our audience briefly in one or two minutes what problems you are referring to? Okay. Yes. Well, we could have an entire conference uh, about that, and it's not confined to the to the U.S. So uh, we have. Uh, many markets that uh, are dominated by firms with uh, with a lot of market power and um, uh, antitrust enforcement, at least in, in the U.S. over the past few decades has not been, in, in my opinion, as strong as it is, it is needed to be. And so we are in a situation where, uh, where we have market power, it's become hard for uh, at least U.S. antitrust enforcers to, uh, to reach that and and address it and uh, i think that uh, that we do need a more aggressive antitrust enforcement like i said i don't think that uh, has much of anything to do with inflation um but it would improve things for uh for consumers for workers and uh and i think and and, and so i think that's something that's that's very important i just don't want the statements that market power is not causing inflation, that antitrust enforcement agencies or competition authorities um, don't have a big role in flighting inflation be taken as a statement that um, it, we don't have a really, really important task in front of us in trying to address market power and promote competition. Anna, Anna did you have any comments or thoughts? <laughs> 
Well, um, I fully agree with Martin that it is always a good time to, <laughs> to claim for stronger competition policy enforcement. If anything, I think we have under enforcement, not over enforcement. So it's always a, a good thing. Uh, regarding the relationship between inflation and uh, reduced competition, uh, as, um, as uh, my co-panelist was uh, speaking, I was re just recalling when there was this spike in natural gas prices. I, 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 I went to visit Venice at that time, and I recall that uh, um, all the Murano glass uh, uh, manufacturers were uh, mentioning how many uh, uh, firms had closed uh, uh, at that time. Obviously, there are shakeouts, as there's uh, uh, these price spikes in energy or um, uh, that might have obviously impacts in terms of uh, a market structure, at least temporarily. Whether that's permanent or not, that's that's a different issue. Um, so in terms of comments, uh, that's, that's it. But I know, Valur, that you want me to speak on labor markets. I don't know if it's now or later on. <laughs> we are all, always running out of time, but before we maybe move into the labor markets, are there any questions from the audience? One in the back. Just yeah, throw it. Uh, hi, I'm Bjorn from Viðskiptabladið. Uh, so I'm a journalist for the English speaking here. Uh, my question is to Ausgeir. You talked about um, that higher inflation would uh, harm competition. So I would like to ask how. Uh, regulations from the central bank, like uh, for example the regulation from September last year where you set the uh, payment uh, at maximum 35% for housing. Um, how does that uh, rhyme with the idea of uh, competition and how does, uh, can it, could it be that regulations from the government can harm um, competition? Yes, I can, I can answer. No, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it is quite clear that, that this regulation is directed against competition in the lending market or to pre prevent the race to the absolute bottom or pre prevent the um, lenders in this country, whether it be pension funds or, or banks, to, to compete in um, in lower uh, in taking lower actually collateral, and that's so that that is actually something that you saw in the years so 2005 to 2008, where, where there was basically kind of this race to the bottom that the banks were competing in in uh, lending with with no equity. So we think this is is a harmful competition and um, and basically goes against um, um, consumer um, protection mm -hmm. okay. so, but uh, but uh, but it's quite quite clear I mean we but it is quite clear we are affecting competition in the financial markets we uh, and, and there are other regulations that we at the central bank like bans on foreign lending that the banks cannot lend to entities that don't have foreign Revenue, mm, but that that's also preventing kind of this, uh, you know, ra race to the absolute bottom. Thank you. Uh, you will get a further opportunity to discuss with the journalist journalists from Viskita Pladet properly after the meeting. Um, so if we step back uh, a little bit and go from the focus on the causal relationship or the correlation between inflation. Uh, uh, and competition policy. Uh, there are the other aspects of it, as uh, since high inflation uh, least leads uh, uh, to lower purchasing power if the wages do not follow. Uh, and then uh, I'm interested to know are, what are the uh, researches and what does competition uh, policy tell us about labor markets and, comp and competition? Anna. Thank you, Valur. Okay, so um, we've been discussing about competition policy, inflation, and consumers. But if you if you take a 360 degrees approach to what 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 are the strains that inflation can put on citizens, 
you have their role left as consumers. We we talked about that and how competition policy is important to um, to to impose discipline on prices. You have them as taxpayers, uh, so they pay. Uh, uh, how much uh, governments are spending on public procurement. And, and on that, I can also add from my experience, from seeing uh, we follow this topic quite a lot in Portugal, and uh, there's a lot of scope for f further optimizing the public spending in terms of public procurement. If you look at the degree of participation in public uh, procurement procedures, that's very low. We still have a lot of direct awards. Uh, um, in, on average, direct awards have no more than two participants per tender. So there's lo a lot of scope for savings there. And I think that's important, obviously, in addition to uh, uh, combating bid rigging. Now, then there's the, the, the side of uh, uh, citizens as workers. And on that, I think competition policy can promote uh, purchasing power by promoting uh, more inclusive growth. And how? By ensuring uh, that, can, uh, that workers are not deprived from the opportunity to change careers or jobs. And that is done both by uh, advocating for the removal of barriers to uh, switching of workers, for example, in terms of accessing self-regulated uh, uh, professions, but also on combating anti-competitive conduct in the labor market. I think we would all agree that it's not fair if you find out firms are uh, 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 making an agreement be between themselves not to pass on inflation uh, to the salaries. That doesn't sound fair to anybody. Um, uh, at the Portuguese Competition Authority uh, this year, we issued a, a, a final decision regarding uh, an agreement not to poach uh, workers between football clubs. And they did this agreement after trying to meet with the unions in order to decrease prices, not having reached that uh, agreement, then they did a no-poach agreement uh, that they wouldn't hire each other's workers. In, in an inflationary context, as I said, uh, uh, I, I, one can, might think about wage-fixing agreements in order not to, 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 to increase uh, price, uh, wages to, to workers. That is important in terms of the harm it may do to workers, but not also, because that distorts allocative efficiency. It distorts price signals in the labor markets, and thus can also harm to, uh, d does a lot of, of harm to consumers too. This is a, a priority area for us at the Portuguese Competition Authority, and I think uh, relevant for ensuring purchasing power. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Anna. Uh, we're almost running out of time, and I'm wondering, is there anyone uh, that has a final question or for the panelists, apart from the journalists from Viskita Blade. One question per person. Breki, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, yes. short uh, question. Uh, is it on? Yeah. Uh, we discussed inflation as a bad, but and trying to challenge you a bit. Can it sometimes be something which is good? I was thinking about sustainability agreements between uh, companies which is uh, a debate that is now raging, that sometimes it can be uh, acceptable from a competition law perspective to actually allow agreements between companies if there is a small reduction of competition but great benefits to consumers. But that, since it, green innovation is costly, that might also result in, uh, in higher prices and perhaps an increase in inflation. So, yeah. And uh, my name is Karl Lundvall. I'm from the Swedish uh, Competition Authority. Thank okay. you. Is there anyone of the panel that... Yeah, has I, well, I, I can answer that. that. It's not really linked that much to inflation, but it's an important policy question. And uh, from that point of view, frankly, the basic principles are already there and the are horizontal guidelines, right? Uh, the, the only reason we let you cooperate is if you can convince us that there are kind of enough synergies and will be passed on to consumers. Now we do this both explicitly if you're outside of the exemption and for the exemption essentially you get the exemption under the presumption that if the market shares are small enough the harm to consumer is going to be to be small but also it's much more likely that if small firms get together there's going to be some efficiency benefit in terms of economy of scale, scope and things like that. So, so, so the logic is there. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of sustainability agreement, as you know, we are revising the horizontal guideline. And as you might already know, uh, we actually have kind of a new section 
on sustainability agreement. And one of the things that we do there is go beyond the guideline to deal with one aspect which is a bit more specific to the sustainability agreement, which is, what is this aspect? It's labeling. Why? Because the usual economist response is saying, well, you know, green, green, fine. If consumers like green, they'll pay for it. Right? And there are two counter-arguments for that. One is the externality, out-of-market externalities that I'm not going to get into. Uh, but another one is that, yes, yes, you know, I can signal that I'm green through my labels, but if you have 250 green labels, consumers no longer know what those labels mean. So that actually there might be some, some efficiencies there uh, in kind of cooperating and having a reduced number of labeling. And that's the kind of issues that uh, the, the new proposed guidelines are meant to address. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Martin and then Oscar. So uh, I think first I'll concur with uh, with the other, the other points. It's certainly possible that, that firms can do something uh, collaboratively via joint venture or some other kind of thing that um, ultimately is pro-competitive and benefits uh, benefits consumers, whether it's sustainability or some other area. However, I think that, that we have to be very careful here. Um, it, Antitrust is is already quite difficult and challenging, and sort of adding in all kinds of goals um, on top of competition or separate from competition, particularly if they conflict, um, makes a, a very difficult task that much more complicated. And it's not obvious to me that competition policy is the right policy lever for these kinds of social goals. We know that uh, that competitive markets don't uh, don't function optimally under another number of circumstances, um, but um, but making them less competitive is not the obvious best way to address those things. And so I think one has to think very carefully about these things and not simply jump to um, lacks competition enforcement as a way to achieve these social goals. Okay. Just very briefly, I think um, on, the, on the benefits of inflation, it, it depends if, if it is inflation in or changes in, in the relative prices or overall uh, movement just in the general price level. Because there are benefits from changes in relative pricing that come from real um, with, with that actually carry a real economic assets, and one can very easily um, maintain, for example. But some of the inflation that is now passing through is justified, as you mentioned, just, just that because the price of energy, of fossil fuel energy, was just underpriced in many ways. One can, can also um, infer that some of the prices also of uh, especially as the tradable goods was too low, um, given what was kind of based on actually false premises regarding global su supply lines, supply chains. Um, for small open economies like Iceland, inflation has been used for benefit, mainly through devaluations. Mm, because with a devaluation, you can uh, kind of like adjust the purchasing power within the country with the export capabilities. And that's what we have done quite many times. And that's one of the benefits of having a, um, your own currency that we have. The bad inflation is, is a kind of an automatic increase. Um, now, usually in the, in the anglo saxon media is, the, you know, refer to as second round effects. It is basically inflation that carries no information signal and just passes through. And um, so from the experience, um, from our experience in this country, in Iceland, we, um, since we have a very long and faithful experience with inflation in the past, it is quite clear that inflation of this kind that is automatic, disturbs the price signals, and leads to a lower competition. People just simply cannot compare prices between different parties, or different companies, or different stores. 
So, um, so that is my one, one of my main reasons for that. If inflation will become persistent in our society, it will create a lot of damage to the corporate sector in this country. Thank you, Oscar. Uh, we're probably coming to an end uh, today, uh, or whether Pierre is willing to delay the ECN meeting later today. If you want to, if we want to continue with our discussion here, <laughs> okay, we will not delay the ECN meeting. Um, we have great speakers here today: uh, Lilia, Paul, Pierre, and our panelists that we're very thankful for having here. Uh, before we end. Uh, I have one question, uh, or two questions, and uh, one minute for each of you to answer us briefly. Uh, so just for us to help us here in the room and, and to give some food for thought for our minister, uh, what can competition authorities and the government do uh, to help in the fight for increasing prices, or you could uh, uh, frame it in a way and then the help and fight for increased market power uh, and fight the cost of living crisis that many ec economists around the world are facing these days. And I think we will just go from Pierre, Ausgeir, Anna and Martin. Increased vigilance for collusion. Uh, make sure that labor markets can adjust in a competitive uh, manner and then keep doing our job. You know, there's been a theme in the latest in intervention about the signaling effect of prices. Mm -hmm. And as we know, prices signal the relevant things better if prices are closer to the relevant measure of cost. And that's one benefit of competition policy that is often underestimated, that precisely because the price are better signals, then the implementation of other type of policies like subsidies and taxation becomes easier and more transparent in a more competitive environment. Thank you. Well, I think, I, I mean, um, as I said before, uh, in, a, in, in a small open economies like Iceland, there, there's always this trade-off between um, scale and, um, and the competition or the number of um, um, participants in this market. And um, also in a small market, there is always some kind of a market power that is actually uh, exerted by the companies, and you can just see it, that every sector is basically dominated by two, three, four actors. And um, so competition policy is very important uh, in that regard, uh, especially in the medium to longer term. And as I said before, we always have to be quite careful to understand that um, competition also, also comes from abroad, especially regarding tradable goods goods and um, um, so the main thing should, should be on um, making sure that there are no barriers to entry but but competition in competition authorities in Iceland are should specially focus on service providers that don't have uh, competition coming from abroad so the so the service um, um, economy should be the main focus. And are you referring to the banking sector as well and financial services? Or well, just services, there are many, 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 many type of, of services and and um, and also let me just add um, as I said, um, monetary policy is not not just a question of of, of uh, changing the the actually the um, interest rates, I think the, it's also a question of the social contract, coordination. And one of the um, advantages of being a very small nation is that we uh, could be able to contain um, the second order effect from inflation, contain the relative price signals transferring into a kind of this um, old inflation of the past. I can just see here that the quite, or at least the people, some of the people are maybe too young to remember how, um, how um, the inflationary um, environment was in this country, where um, where the um, co where corporates would basically take cue from 
the evaluations, they would all work for labor union contracts and they would all raise prices at the same time in a coordination. Mm -hmm. So it's quite important that we work together in this. And this, so the central bank can, can never, never be alone. Monetary policy that we try to implement without uh, the public support and uh, or, or, or the nation is, is just impossible. And I think that you know this is this is just just one other angle of that. Thank you, Anna. Your final remarks. Um, vigorous uh, and um, enforcement against cartels, obviously, as as Pierre has pointed out, particularly in sectors that are very important, uh, and uh, also uh, in 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 public procurement, in order to ensure that you have efficient public uh, spending and that you can channel the resources of the state to better uses than. Than, than to, to feed onto uh, cartels. Uh, then I think uh, um, uh, in addition to uh, all the advocating for lowering barriers to entry and to showing how this can help uh, um, uh, uh, also uh, the industries and markets react to supply shortages if you have lower barriers to entry, also keep uh, um, an advocacy role because uh, there's a lot of government intervention uh, at times like this and when you see, for example, uh, public information, uh, if you have uh, interventions like administrative price, price levels and you have regulators publishing information on margins or, or, or reference uh, prices, it's important to signal the risk that that brings to competition. I think that's a very important role for us to play uh, in terms of competition right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Martin, uh, you're the last in line. Thanks. Well, I'm going to reiterate what others have said. Uh, enforcement agencies should do what they do, and uh, and that's that's just as before because it's it's important. It remains important. Uh, avoid getting distracted by uh, these calls for inflation fighting. Some of it's unavoidable, so there will be congressional calls, uh, say in the U.S., to investigate gasoline prices. That happens with some regularity. As a matter of fact, when I was at the FTC, we had, um, we had some economists who were um, uh, spending a fair amount of their time on an ongoing basis keeping track of the gasoline industry, not because we ever found evidence of anti-competitive activities there, but because we knew there would be calls from uh, people in the U.S. Congress uh, for the FTC to investigate, and we needed to be ready. Unfortunately, that prevented us from devoting those resources to working on things that actually mattered for competition. So stay the course, resist temptations like that. And then I think it's important, very important, that uh, competition economists, competition authorities have a seat at the table in economic policy more broadly. As the other panelists had pointed out, and Anna just gave uh, some great examples of this, um, there are all kinds of economic policies that are getting formulated, particularly in times like these, and competition sometimes gets left out inadvertently. And so uh, folks in central banks, folks in departments of labor, folks who are working on um, uh, regulating energy sectors, healthcare sectors, et cetera, where government plays a large role, should, be, uh, should have competition economists um, that, that they can call on to get their expertise and opinions on that. And I think that's actually something very important. It's always important, but particularly now when so many things are happening. Thank you, Martin. Uh, uh, I would like to thank the panel uh, for lively discussions. But uh, lastly, for our last five minutes, I would like to welcome Sveit Agnarsson, uh, the chairman of the board of the Icelandic Competition Authority, to close uh, the, this morning conference. Uh, here this morning we have discussed the relationship between competition and inflation and the cost of living. And we have in particular been contemplating whether dominant corporations may be using their market power to raise market prices more than they otherwise would. 
And some authorities maintain that this greedflation is an important cause of the rising prices observed all over the world. And these ideas are of special importance for a small economy like Iceland, where the domestic markets are generally characterized by olig oligopoly, two or three firms completely dominating the most important markets. It is, though, difficult, as, as from, from what we've seen this morning, to blame increases in concentration on the rising inflation rate observed. Studies do show that there have been moderate increases in concentration, both in the Europe and in the US over the last years, but this is a slow trend, and a slow growth rate cannot explain a fast growth rate like inflation. And we do, of course, know today that the roots of the current inflation can be traced to rising energy prices. There is ample evidence that shows that market power may most certainly cause high prices, but not rapidly rising prices, and there is a difference in these. Uh, <clears throat> so classical competition policy, it's mostly concerned with things like mercy controls, cartel control, antitrust, and proportionality, uh, and market distortions brought about by state aid. And that remains the case. The conservative nature of competition policy and competition authorities make it difficult to interfere in the workings of the market, like fiscal and monetary authorities do. We have also seen, for instance, that policies, competition policies take a long time to, 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 to have an impact. And that is far longer time than we would think would be uh, than, con than corresponds to the current rates of inflation that we have seen. So what then can we do? What can competition authorities do and what should they do? Incentives have not changed. Firms will not change their behavior. And inflation may indeed facilitate collusion, at least tacit collusion, by giving a signal of price increases, and making anti-competitive behavior much harder to detect, provide excuses for firms who are wishing to engage in communication, coordination, and cooperation. And how then should the agent authorities respond, including the Icelandic Competition Authority? Well, by maintaining their vigilance, look for signs of potential collusions, carefully examine the policies pursued to fight inflation, and make sure that they do not contaminate the basic principles of competitions. Keep an eye on key sectors where the, poly where the prices have increased c considerably. And we should also remember what has been said here about that the lack of competition is still uh, an, an, an urgent problem. We do not necessarily have over-regulation. We most likely have under regulation. It is important, though, to be aware of the role that inflation can play. We have discussed here how inflation can impact on market structure, how inflation can have an impact on prices, on the public procurement, on the labor market. And that is all something that we should be very much aware of. Uh, in competition, we have seen the need for, for more uh, advocacy, that people should be be uh, thinking about pro-competitive reforms of possibly reducing barriers to entry in certain markets. We have also been seeing, having here discussed, to, to raise the awareness that changes of price controls may have on different sectors in the economy. I think all these issues are very important for us here, here in Iceland because precisely we are a small open economy with a history of high tradition and a history of persistent inflation. And that is something that we should take from this meeting today. Before closing this conference, I would like to thank the participants in the event. Special thanks go to Lilia Doug Alfredsdotti, Minister of Culture and Business Affairs, Pierre Chibo, Chief Competition Economist at the GG Competition, Anna-Sophia Rodriguez, Head of the
Portuguese uh, competition authorities, Martin Gaynor at the University, at the Carnegie Mellon University, in the United States, and Oscar Jonsson, Governor of the Central Bank of Iceland. I thank you all for attending the meeting in person or online, and thank you for your participation. I do hope that you will all enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you.